welcome to the program an introduction to commercial real estate fundamentals I'm your host Lauren Kime with real estate's next level education and with Lehigh University's Goodman Center for real estate studies and this is the first installment of our video series one of my mentors Ralph Williams once told me that commercial real estate is the tip of the iceberg of free society without the ability to buy sell and trade real property we don't truly own anything and we can't really be a free capitalistic society the commercial real estate industry touches virtually every aspect of business and industry in the United States and most of the free world. Very few companies can grow without acquiring more land or additional office space. Patients can't use the services of a hospital unless it's constructed. And consumers can't shop at Walmart or Target without the development of real property. Commercial real estate encompasses all aspects of sales, leasing, management, investment in, or improvement of office buildings, retail properties, industrial properties, multifamily and mixed-use investment properties, uh, farmland, business opportunities, hotels and hospitality properties, medical facilities, and dozens of other types of property. Our job in the industry is to assist in the development, lease, management, or sales of property and to advise our clients of their best courses of action when deciding how to invest in or improve real property or commercial asset. We work directly with industry leaders, community leaders, uh, government officials, lawyers, zoning officers, accountants, mortgage companies, banks, title companies, appraisers, utility companies, and everyone in between to put together sales or develop property to its potential for a client. And while we can't make decisions for our clients, we can assist them in making better informed decisions. And we can help our clients to understand what the highest and best use may be for a particular type of property or what type of investment vehicle might be best for our client. We work with property owners who may want to sell or lease a property, have a property developed or managed, or determine what use might be better for the property than the current use. We work with users of properties to find the best location for their business or investment, to determine if it's better for the user to lease or purchase a property, and to understand the tax implications of their decisions. Additionally, we work with investors to determine which real estate venture might be their best investment to meet their particular goals and needs. Commercial real estate agents and brokers work with individuals, investors, organizations, and corporations to develop property to its highest potential. Our careers include many specializations. Some commercial associates specialize in particular property types, such as office property, shopping centers, developable farmland, or even amusement parks. Other commercial associates specialize in particular forms of consulting work for real estate investment trusts, pension funds, insurance companies, or utility companies. And still others work in specialized areas such as resort management or to assist government agencies with the redevelopment of industrial sites or reclamation of land. The path you choose to take now, venturing into a career in commercial real estate, may open many unexpected doors in your future. So why become a commercial real estate agent? Although commercial real estate professionals come in all shapes and sizes and from all walks of life, there are three primary types of individuals who select commercial real estate as a career path. Residential agents making a switch to commercial, brand new real estate agents coming from another industry or career, and college students who obtain a degree in real estate or finance. Realtors with experience in residential property will sometimes make a shift into commercial real estate because of the lure of high sales prices and the potential for greater earning power on the commercial side of the spectrum. They also realize that listing appointments and showings are more likely to happen during the business hours that they'd like than in the evening and on the weekends and that they may be able to build a better lifestyle for themselves. The reason only a small percentage of residential agents ever sell commercial real estate, however, is because they're daunted by the math and by the research to evaluate commercial clients. If you're part of this group of potential future commercial agents, have no fear. If you can calculate the monthly payment, closing costs, and qualifying ratios of an FHA mortgage for your residential clients, then you can certainly learn the basics of financial analysis and return on investment. Those who enter the field of commercial real estate from another field are often investors themselves, or the friends of a commercial broker, or are coming from a financial field or a former small business ownership. This group generally excels at bringing their skills into commercial brokerage. Remember, 
that part of commercial brokerage is learning to evaluate financial opportunities, but part of it is also being able to effectively communicate with business owners, investors, and comfortably meet and represent clients. The final group that enters real estate is made up of those that attend top colleges and universities to learn the field of commercial real estate. For the last decade at Lehigh University's Goodman Center for Real Estate, I've had the privilege of teaching and learning from students who've gone on to be some of the top names in our field. With the advanced knowledge they learn in evaluating large projects, office complexes, skyscrapers, and similar properties, these former students tend to work on high-value projects in major markets like Manhattan, Boston, and Washington, D.C. If you're part of the first two groups making a transition into commercial real estate, don't be concerned about those with advanced degrees. The commercial real estate industry includes every type of real estate investment in every market around the country and the globe. C.S. Lewis wrote, you are never too old to set another goal or dream a new dream. The most important key is to take the leap into this endeavor because you can and will be successful. Of course, in this video program you're watching today, we'll explore the various types of commercial property, learn the key terminology of each type of property, and how to walk and talk like a commercial realtor. Again, I welcome you to the wonderful world of commercial real estate. It's a big world full of many legal and mathematical questions. It can be a very frustrating roller coaster ride of a career but it can also be a very exciting, challenging, and rewarding career. It's one of the few careers where your income is truly only limited by your imagination. Let's start today by outlining the major types of real estate investment vehicles. Although there are dozens of types of commercial properties, we've identified 10 major broad categories. Number one, office buildings or office space. Number two are retail buildings or retail space. And the third is shopping centers which are collections of retail spaces. Fourth are industrial buildings or flexible space. Fifth will be describing hotels and hospitality properties. Six, multifamily property. Number seven is farm and ranch property. Number eight is vacant developable land. Number nine is gonna be senior housing and long-term care facilities and we'll finish up with business opportunities. We'll go through each one in detail and give you a feel for each. We'll start with office buildings or office space. So what are office buildings really? What does class A space mean? And what's the difference between a low rise building and a high rise building? An office building or office space is a place where people work, answer telephones, have coffee breaks, and chat around the water cooler. An office building can be as simple as a home in a business district that's been converted for use as an office, or a complex like a 50-story office tower in Manhattan or DC. Most recently constructed office buildings are simply large boxes of space carved up by architects into various smaller boxes containing rooms or collections of rooms to fit the needs of the end user. These buildings can be occupied by a single end user or can be broken up into multiple users or multiple tenants. Office buildings are generally categorized three different ways. They're categorized by the quality of space class A, class B, and class C, by the height of the building, low rise, mid rise, or high rise, or by usable space or square footage. The most common method classifying by quality of space is a bit, shall we say, subjective. Despite many attempts by organizations to classify quality of space, there is no hard and fast definition. I realize there are probably several lifelong commercial brokers that are now running to their computers to write me nasty notes to explain that there are definitive determining factors for class A versus class C. But the truth is that one realtor's class B is another realtor's class A. Despite dozens of articles and extensively described definitions, experts cannot completely agree on any one definition. And commercial real estate brokers in their respective marketplaces do not follow any one set of definitions. A great standard breakdown of the differences between classes was devised by the National Association for Industrial and Office Parks, or the NAIOP. The basic rules of thumb are as follows. Class A generally means that the property is high quality and that it's either new or in near new condition. The space should have a modern design, the finished work should be excellent, and the ability for high-speed communications has to be in place. Building systems must meet current tenant needs and anticipated needs, and the building maintenance and management must be average or better. 
Some brokers additionally determine Class A by location. For example, an excellent location by the crossroads of two interstates might earn a designation of Class A, while a similar building downtown next to a brownfield might be considered Class B. Class A properties tend to command the highest rental rates in a market. Class A space also typically includes those office buildings that capture the top 30 to 40 percent of rental rates in a given marketplace. Class B offices are generally in good condition and they're highly rentable. They tend to command a lower rental rate than Class A properties and may not have all the bells and whistles of Class A property in the same area, but are in average or better condition and they should be solidly managed. Class B buildings might also have some functional obsolescence. Class C office properties are generally dated or have some functional obsolescence, such as poor layouts or perhaps a lack of high-speed computer line availability. These properties may be found in less desirable locations and are generally characterized by lower rental rates. Now, in providing full disclosure, you will probably never see an advertisement reading spectacular Class C office space available for just $16 a square foot. So who actually determines the class of each property being marketed? Well, we do. The real estate broker or associates that's listing the property for lease or sale is the one who sets the label in the advertising and online. And of course, real estate brokers and associates will typically try to slant upward the value of the property they're marketing. So what's an honest comparison between true Class A office space and Class B office space? As I said, the differences between the classes has to primarily do with the condition and the amenities, although location can play a key role as well. These classifications can be somewhat subjective because the terms A and B are not set in stone. Brand new space is typically considered Class A when it's built, but can Class B space be updated to Class A? Well, it depends on your marketplace. In some urban locations, there are definitive characteristics of Class A versus Class B. For example, in Manhattan, Class A generally means there's property management on the premises. It also means that the building doesn't have interior columns, which might reduce a tenant's ability to redefine the space to meet their needs. In some locations outside Manhattan, Class A includes on-site parking where Class B may not. Across the majority of the country and globe, the office building's location can't be changed. So if the building is located in a downtown area in a secondary market, it may be difficult to market as Class A. However, replacing windows, replacing carpeting, updating the lobby to add a waterfall or a garden, and configuring the layout to fit most modern office work can bring a property back up to Class A level. The factors that brokers consider in comparing properties for quality of space include location, access to high-speed networking, on-site management, ceiling heights, and ease of fit-outs on-site parking, construction, the quality of common areas such as the lobby, access to highways or public transportation, on-site amenities such as a gym or a snack room, proximity to off-site amenities such as restaurants, entertainment, and dry cleaning, HVAC capacity, elevator quantity and speed, the floor load capacity, backup power, and security. The second method we use to classify office buildings is by height, low-rise, mid-rise, and high-rise. A low-rise building is considered to be any office building that's less than seven stories. A mid-rise is any office building between seven and 25 stories, and a high-rise is anything above 25 stories. And finally, we classify office buildings by the use of the building. We do this because it makes the search for the right kind of building a bit easier. For example, a medical office building generally has water lines and plumbing available in units, which makes it more conducive to a medical use than a general office building. The types of office buildings by use include a general office building or simply office building, and that's any building primarily used for business functions. A medical office building, office buildings containing space designated specifically for medical functions, including medical labs, physician's offices, dental offices, and other medical functions. A research and development office building. These are office buildings that contain space used for research and development activities and these types of buildings may include specific lab space and storage areas. Institutional or government offices are those used for government agencies and purposes. There are two other forms of office space 
that include executive office suites, which are also known as shared office spaces. These are business centers that provide the tenants with space for their business and shared space that may be used for conference rooms, receptionists, and mail services that are common between different businesses. And finally, office condos. A portion of an office building can be deeded and occupied by an individual or business. One of the key components of working with office buildings and office space is learning how to measure that space. That may sound simple, but it may not be. If you're representing a property owner, the owner will want to accurately determine the size so they don't lose any potential income. Prospective tenants will want an accurate determination so they don't overpay for the space they're leasing. When selling an office building for a single user, a realtor can often find the square footage or size of the building by consulting the original building plans or the information kept by the local tax records. If you as a realtor are going to represent space in an office building for lease, you'll need to consider what space is actually being leased. Office buildings generally have usable space, also known as rentable space, and what are known as common areas. Usable space, or rentable space, is that enclosed space used exclusively by the tenant. That may include staircases, if the tenant leases multiple floors. Tenants in office space, as well as tenants in retail or industrial, typically pay for the space on a per square foot basis. A common area or common space is that space that is shared by or for the benefit of multiple tenants. The lobby of an office building, common hallways, shared bathrooms on floors where there are multiple tenants, elevators, and mechanical rooms are all examples of common area or common space. One method of distinguishing usable space from common space is to determine if the landlord's insurance policy or the tenant's insurance policy covers the space. If the landlord's policy covers the space, it's generally considered to be common space. Conventions for charging for space differ from location to location and owner to owner. For example, in some areas, it's typical for a landlord or management firm to charge only for the usable space or the space which the tenant occupies and cover the cost of the additional building space in common area maintenance fees or CAM fees. Another method to cover the cost of common space is to allocate a percentage of the common space to each unit. It's a convention called charging a common area factor. So the rentable square footage, or the area the tenant pays for, is a combination of the usable square footage plus the common area factor in these areas where that convention is prevalent. Let's do a quick calculation to explain the common area factor. If the common space in a building is approximately 15% of the total building, a landlord may charge the tenant for 15% more space or more square footage than they're occupying. For example, if a tenant is leasing 1,000 square feet, the tenant may be charged for 1,150 square feet. Common area factor equals the percentage of common space times the usable square footage. So the common area factor equals 15% times 1,000 square feet. That's 150 square feet added to the rentable square footage. So the rentable square footage equals usable square footage plus the common area factor, or 1,000 square feet plus 150 square feet equals 1,150 square feet. So how do we determine the space is usable or leasable? Can't we just measure the interior walls? The Building Owners and Managers Association, or BOMA, have created a complete set of standards for measuring rentable space. But understanding the BOMA standards takes a fair bit of study and practice. Our purpose in this course is to give you a broad understanding of the commercial real estate industry. And the BOMA standards encompass 18 double-sided pages plus a set of 26 commonly asked questions. So we're not going to go into the entire code here. To obtain a complete set of these standards, you can call BOMA at the number on the screen, 1-800-426-6292, or order them online. Local chapters of BOMA also offer half-day classes on how to apply the standards. In some specific areas like New York City and Washington DC, local real estate organizations have designed alternate plans for measuring space. The Real Estate Board of New York has created the REBNY standard, which is used to measure leased office space in the New York metropolitan area, including nearby parts of Connecticut and New Jersey. The GWCAR standard is used to measure leased office space in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, including nearby parts of Maryland and Virginia. 
Arguments persist today among various organizations as to what is considered usable space. For example, some brokers and landlords insist that bathrooms in a hallway on a floor that's entirely occupied by one tenant should be considered usable space, while the BOMA standards indicate that that space might be considered to be a common space. A locked closet in a mechanical room that's dedicated to one tenant's computer equipment might be considered usable space or it might be considered common space depending on who you listen to. Although the preferred method of measurement is to use that BOMA system, many realtors simply measure the exterior dimensions of the building and reduce it by any common areas such as bathrooms or lobbies. Other agents determine the space of the property by obtaining an architect's drawing or a building plan and multiplying out the dimensions. If a plan of the building is unavailable, a realtor may be forced to measure the space by hand. I always suggest you draw the space as you measure it in order to make sure you include the entire space. Hallways, closets, and bathrooms within a tenant's private areas we consider to be part of the space the tenant's leasing. And finally, let's discuss the lease types of office space. Although the rent for occupying and using office space can be charged in many ways, which will be described in detail in our leasing video, the most common types of rent include a gross lease, also known as a full service lease, a hybrid net lease, or a triple net lease. Under the terms of a gross lease, the tenant pays one all-inclusive rate to the owner, almost like staying at an all-inclusive resort in the Caribbean. Everything's included. The owner pays the utilities, the taxes, maintenance, and other expenses on the building. A triple net lease, on the other hand, has the tenant paying a rental fee to the landlord and then paying all utilities, plus paying a percentage of the building's maintenance, taxes, and insurance, which are included in a separate fee called a common area maintenance fee or CAM fee. A hybrid net lease shares some of the expense between the tenant and landlord. A gross lease puts the risk of rising building costs on the landlord, where a triple net lease puts the risk of rising maintenance and utility costs to the building on the tenant. When advising clients, it's critical for you to analyze the tenant's total estimated expense under the terms of the lease. For example, if a tenant is considering building A at a gross lease or full service lease of $5,000 a month and a second building B is only asking $3,000 a month but under a triple net lease, it's still possible that the first option is better although it looks more expensive on the surface. Rental rates are generally quoted on a per year basis. For example, if a broker or owner is advertising a rate of $24 per square foot, that's typically $24 per square foot per year. If you divide by 12 months, it's $2 per square foot per month. The second form of commercial property is the retail building or retail space. I'm defining retail space as a separate class from shopping centers because shopping centers are really a separate kind of investment. They are collections of retail spaces combined in a single center and managed as a single center. Retail space, on the other hand, is often categorized either by the type of building that's housing the space, such as a corner freestanding building versus a big box store, or differentiated by the type of retail usage, such as automotive or prepared foods. For example, if you have a prospective tenant or buyer looking to open a restaurant, it helps to have a property already configured as a restaurant. A tavern will need a liquor license and an automotive service station will need bays to hold cars and the proper zoning for automotive uses. The various types of retail can be limited only by your imagination, but the major categories include freestanding retail buildings, which is a commercial building that's independent from other buildings around it or is not attached to another structure. This can refer to anything from a McDonald's to a CVS to an independent tavern. A pad site, which is a freestanding parcel, generally located in front of a larger commercial property such as a shopping center or a strip mall, and it may be an out parcel of a larger property. Typically pad sites are premium sites because of their high visibility and are often occupied by fast food, restaurants, gas stations, drug stores, or banks. Pad sites may be purchased or the land may be leased to the user for their business. A shopping center, as I mentioned, is a collection of retail spaces that we'll cover in the next section. And big box retail are any retail establishment that requires large amounts of space, such as a pharmacy, a grocery store, a department store, a large hardware or appliance store, or anything similar. Typically, the interior of these stores can be reconfigured with temporary walls. 
A small box retail store is any retail that requires little more than four walls and some decorating. Gift shops, small appliance stores, or maybe even a dollar store. And then special use retail are those establishments set up for a specific type of business, such as automotive repair garage, which generally lends itself best to another automotive type use without a significant conversion. A commercial greenhouse is another example of a special use property. A retail condo is created when a retail building has been converted into condominiums so that the user or investor can purchase a section of a larger building. And finally, a residential conversion can often be found in older sections of cities and towns. Residential properties which have been converted into neighborhood taverns, small restaurants, corner stores or gift shops. Retail properties are also categorized by their use, but there are literally hundreds of uses. A bit much to go into here without driving our viewers completely insane. But retail uses can be anything from taverns to drugstores, consumer electronics to sporting goods, daycares, building materials, and just about anything else you can think of. Shopping centers exist in every part of the United States and around the world. They can be found in many different configurations. The International Council of Shopping Centers, ICSC, has defined a shopping center to be a group of retail and other commercial establishments that is planned, developed, owned and managed as a single property. On-site parking is provided. The center's size and orientation generally determined by the market characteristics of the trade area served by the center. A shopping center generally takes one of two forms. The first is an open-air center which simply refers to a shopping center or complex that's not enclosed. Open-air centers may have canopies connecting storefronts and almost always have walkways in front or between the storefronts, but the storefronts themselves are not enclosed. Some open-air centers are simply strip malls with a straight row of attached retail or commercial stores. Some are U-shaped with a large anchor store in the center or L-shaped with a large anchor store at either end. The second most prevalent form of a shopping center is called the mall. This form of shopping center has enclosed walkways. Storefronts are often turned inside away from the parking area to face the interior enclosed space. Although two primary forms exist for shopping centers, there are many centers that exhibit characteristics of both. Some have stores facing inside with an enclosed mall area or walkway and have additional stores facing out in an open air fashion. These centers are hybrid forms. The International Council of Shopping Centers has defined eight major types of shopping center. These various types are classified primarily by their size and their types of goods and services sold. You'll find that even with these broad classifications, hybrids of various types exist, and new types have been developed each and every decade. The mall forms include regional centers and super regional centers. A regional center is a form of mall containing large anchor tenants such as a traditional department store like Macy's or JCPenney or an upscale department store like Neiman Marcus or Saks Fifth Avenue, a discount department store like Walmart or Target, or fashion department stores and many other specialty stores and stores of general merchandise such as apparel and services. These centers are generally enclosed with stores facing a center walkway or atrium. A regional center is considered by the ICSC to be 400,000 to 800,000 square feet and typically draws most customers from a 5 to 15 mile radius. The primary difference between a regional center and the second form, a super regional center, is size. Considered by the ICSC to be over 800,000 square feet, this form of mall has more anchor tenants and a larger mix of specialty stores and merchandise. Frequently these malls are multi-story configurations. Super regional centers draw their primary customers from a 25 mile radius. Now I'm still trying to figure out what the Mall of America is since it draws people from about 2,000 miles away and probably has its own zip code. Open air forms are divided into six categories including neighborhood center, community center, power center, lifestyle center, theme or festival center, and my wife's favorite, the outlet center. The main differences between the first three, neighborhood center, community center, and power center, revolve around the size of the center and what radius they draw traffic from. The local neighborhood center, for example, attracts most of their clients from within three miles of the center. They're generally configured as straight line strip centers and parking located directly in front. 
These centers may have a canopy or another facade to provide shade and protection from inclement weather or to tie the center together. The tenants tend to be stores catering to the daily needs of the local community, hence the name Neighborhood Center. According to the International Council of Shopping Centers, approximately half of these centers are anchored by a supermarket, while about a third are typically anchored by a drugstore. Stores found in neighborhood centers include those drug, sundry, snack, and personal services stores that service the local community. A community center has a wider draw stretching up to six miles from the center and typically offers a wider range of products than a neighborhood center. Community centers often offer apparel and services. Common anchor tenants for community centers are supermarkets, large drug stores, and discount department stores. Community center tenants can sometimes include big box, category dominant retailers such as Home Depot, Lowe's, Best Buy, Toys R Us, TG Maxx, or other big box retailers. These centers are done in many configurations. Some are straight line strips, while others may be laid out in an L or a U shape. Many of these centers are themed or targeted at particular groups. For example, certain centers that are anchored by a large discount department store may have the majority of focus on discount stores as tenants. The third open air form, the power center, is comprised of several large anchors and very few smaller tenants. The anchors may include a discount department store, off-price stores, warehouse clubs, or big box category killers. The final three open air forms are what I call destination centers because each has a unique attraction that can draw customers from longer distances. A lifestyle center is an open air center that is designed in many cases to resemble a historic downtown or to be laid out for shoppers to browse and relax with exterior benches, fountains, and eye-pleasing designs. This design is called Village Clustered. The key word for a lifestyle center is ambience. Generally located very close to affluent residential neighborhoods, lifestyle centers cater to the retail needs and lifestyle pursuits of consumers in its trading area. They are designed as much a place for residents to stop, browse, and have a casual cup of coffee or lunch as they are for shopping. Typical tenants are upscale national chain specialty stores, high-end restaurants, and entertainment. These centers may be anchored by one or more conventional or fashion specialty department stores. Because a common theme of lifestyle centers is a downtown look, there are often streets between the stores and parking is located throughout the exterior of the center. A theme or festival center is often located in urban areas. These centers may be an adaptive reuse of older buildings or a historic district. Theme centers may be included as part of a mixed use project in redevelopment areas. Theme or festival centers generally have a unifying theme that is carried out by the individual shops and often their merchandise. This unifying theme may be found in the center's architectural design. A common element of these centers is entertainment, although some rely solely on the shopping experience. Although theme centers are generally targeted at tourists, they may also attract local customers. Theme or festival centers may be anchored by restaurants and entertainment facilities. Examples of these centers include San Francisco's Fisherman's Wharf, Sacramento's Old Town, Redondo Beach's Horseshoe Pier, Santa Monica's Third Street Promenade, and City Walk at Universal Studios. Finally, an outlet center, as the name suggests, attracts shoppers looking for discounts on brand name products. Outlet centers draw from a wide radius of 25 to 75 miles. Typically, these centers include manufacturers and retailers outlet stores selling brand name goods at a discount. Although outlet centers are often unanchored, certain brand name stores may serve to attract customers and other tenants to the center. Layouts of outlet centers may be consistent with an open air strip center or may be village clustered like a lifestyle center. There are also some enclosed outlet centers throughout North America. Representing shopping centers. A shopping center's income is often derived from a monthly rental rate plus a percentage of net sales over a break point. For a center to be successful, the operator must consider that its customers are both the consumers shopping at the center as well as the tenants of the center. Strong anchor stores and high quality tenants attract other high quality tenants and also attract consumers which drive up sales and ultimately revenue. The success or failure of a shopping center is composed of many factors. The visibility of the center, 
and the ease of ingress and egress from the property play important roles in attracting consumers. Proximity to the population centers and the demographics of the surrounding population are also critical. As realtors, we may be called on to sell a shopping center, to assist in the site location to build a new center, or to locate tenants for an existing center. We need to analyze the trade area of the center, the competition that exists to the center, and new centers that may be planned or under construction that may pose a competitive threat. The trade area is the area from which the majority of shoppers to a center come from, and it's comprised of three markets. The majority of customers come from a primary market, as consumers seeking to shop at a grocery store or pharmacy seldom drive a significant distance for one retailer over another. A secondary market is made up of those shoppers coming from a further distance, and a tertiary market for those consumers who potentially travel a significant distance for a specialty store or some particular product. Some of the key terms you should be familiar with for shopping centers include anchor store or anchor tenant, that's a large or major retail store such as a grocery store or department store that occupies a significant portion of space in a shopping center and draws customers to the center. Gross leasable area or GLA, the total floor area rented to tenants measured from exterior wall surface to the center of the interior dividing walls between the units. Rent in shopping centers is typically based on gross leasable area. Gross floor area, the entire floor area or square footage of the center, including all common areas. Gross floor area may even include basements. Gross sales area, GSA, the area of retail space accessible to customers for shopping. For example, in a grocery store, the gross sales area does not include the storage areas, the preparation areas, or office space. The parking ratio is the ratio of parking area to gross floor area, and the parking index is the number of parking spaces per every thousand square feet of gross leasable area. And finally, calculating lease payments on shopping centers can be tricky. Although older strip malls may have a gross lease or a hybrid net lease, the majority of shopping center space is rented using a combination of triple net leases and percentage leases. Triple net leases, which again mean that the tenant is responsible for their rent, their utilities, and a percentage of all of their expenses on the property, including taxes, insurance, and maintenance, are commonly used for the out parcels or pad sites of a center, where a single tenant occupies the entire out parcel space. Under a percentage lease, the tenant pays a base rent on the space they occupy and an additional percentage of revenue earned from their business. The underlying concept behind this rental formula is that the landlord's ability to attract strong tenants and provide a successful environment for center increases the financial success of the individual tenants and the landlord shares in that success. The landlord does not begin collecting additional revenue until the tenant exceeds sales over a break point or a natural break point. As an example of a break point is a lease that charges a tenant rent of $24,000 per year plus 3% of sales over $800,000 or rent of $2,000 a month plus 3% of sales over $66,667 a month. Although there are variations in the formula, the natural break point is calculated by dividing the base rent per year by a negotiated percentage to determine the gross sales volume over which the percentage lease will kick in. For example, if a retail unit is leased at $60,000 per year and the negotiated percentage of the lease is 3%, the percentage is paid on income over $2 million in sales based on the natural breakpoint calculation. If sales are $2.5 million, the tenant will pay $60,000 base rent and an additional 3% of $500,000 or an additional $15,000. Shopping center leases will also typically pass through the cost of building and property maintenance, taxes, insurance, and management fees in the form of CAM fees or common area maintenance fees. Our fourth type of property is industrial or flexible space. Industrial property is often described as either light industrial or heavy industrial, although the difference between light industrial and heavy industrial is often vague. Light industrial typically refers to lower impact storage and manufacturing. Light industrial uses may include warehousing, wholesaling, assembly of product, or research and development. 
Heavy industrial typically refers to manufacturing, producing, processing, or refining products or raw materials. Additionally, heavy industrial often requires larger land parcels and accessibility to transportation such as rail lines or major highways. Types of industrial property can be categorized dozens of different ways depending on the type of property, the use, or the construction. The seven basic forms of industrial property are flex space, warehouse space, manufacturing, R&D, self-storage, truck terminals, and cold storage. Flexible or flex space, those are large bulk buildings that can be broken into smaller units. Often flex space can be finished into warehouse, light manufacturing, or even office space. Many flexible buildings have a front entrance at ground level for offices and a rear entrance at truck level or dock height. Although ceiling heights vary, they're typically in the 16 to 24 foot range, which is shorter than distribution warehouses. The second type, distribution warehouses, also known as bulk properties, are generally walls, a roof, and flooring. They tend to be large buildings and are used for storage and distribution of materials, products, or equipment. Some distribution warehouses are measured in cubic feet because height can be important to some types of storage and distribution. A distribution warehouse will generally have several to many loading docks at truck level or docking height or may be set up with drive-in doors for trucks. These buildings generally have less than 15 percent office space and ceiling heights up to about 32 feet. Manufacturing buildings can be either heavy industrial or light industrial use depending on the product and the process to create the product. Manufacturing property can be a single building or a collection of buildings. Some products are even manufactured or assembled outside. Manufacturing buildings or facilities include production, refinement, and assembly. Research and development. R&D can fall under either an office space or an industrial space depending on the type of research and development. R&D uses that require use of heavy equipment may require an industrial property. Additionally, users may require laboratories, clean rooms for chip manufacturing, or chemical processes or analysis. Self-storage in many warehouses. These are commercial facilities that allow individuals or companies to rent space smaller than a warehouse for storage of equipment, products, goods, or even personal items. Self-storage facilities in many warehouse facilities are often located in light industrial zones. Truck terminal, facilities where goods or products are transferred between trucks or between trucks and railroads. Buildings can be used for short-term storage. Cold storage and refrigerated space. This is a specific type of warehouse or distribution space that requires refrigeration. These properties are often measured in cubic feet because ceiling height is very important to the value of the storage space. Locations of industrial space. As a real estate professional working with a prospective buyer or tenant, finding the right property and location is critical to their business. But finding a location can be challenging. In some locations, local governments court manufacturing firms with tax incentives and financing enticements. Other local governments avoid manufacturing or industrial uses. You've heard the term NIMBY, not in my backyard. We'd love to have the jobs, but don't put any building that makes noise, pollution, odor, or traffic near my home. Any purchase or lease of space must include carefully coordinated due diligence. The decision for where an industrial manufacturing or warehouse buyer or tenant might locate is complex. Business operators have to consider the location's potential issues, such as environmental regulations, municipal regulations, property taxes, real estate costs, utility access and cost, and access to transportation facilities including highways and sometimes rail lines. Additionally, they have to consider regional issues such as labor cost, the labor climate and worker skills, and even the quality of life in the area. The proximity of a business to their suppliers and customers can be a significant key component as waiting for a last minute supply of parts might temporarily shut down a manufacturing line and transportation costs can be significant. You have to find a location that allows their particular use because restrictions can be significant on industrial property and also a location that will fit their business needs. Business parks and industrial parks. Modern industrial property is carefully planned by developers and municipalities and is often built close to highways and rail access. Parks for industrial use are created to keep much of these uses in close proximity to each other. 
Parks can share the cost of bringing in large utilities and technologies like gas lines or high-speed internet lines by sharing the cost among several end users. Many business parks are a mix of light industrial, office, warehousing, and distribution uses. Brownfields. Central areas and major cities were used for heavy manufacturing at one time in our country's history. Factories were built close to the labor pool and housing grew around the factories. In modern day America, many of these properties are located in areas that are difficult to access from major highway systems or have significant environmental issues. Redevelopment of these brownfield sites has been a major political goal for the last several decades. Freestanding. Sites that are developed for a single user are generally called freestanding sites. You'll also find that in some locations where industry has moved away, large industrial buildings or warehouses have been converted to alternate uses, such as theme shopping areas, call centers, or even interior self-storage warehouses. The next type of property are hospitality properties. Hospitality properties are those properties concerned with lodging, vacations, and recreation. This category of commercial real estate includes hotels, motels, bed and breakfasts, casinos, convention centers, golf courses, recreational cabins, spas, and even vacation rentals. The category may also include amusement parks, indoor water parks, and similar uses. Although some hospitality properties, like B&Bs or recreational cabins, tend to be updated infrequently, many hospitality properties can be very capital intensive with continual updates, additions, and remodeling. According to the International Society of Hospitality Consultants, real estate agents and brokers that specialize in this particular category or subcategory need to go beyond the typical analysis of buying and selling the property to identify value-added strategies, including remodeling and expansion and repositioning strategies into their projections. Evaluations of particular properties or projects need to take into consideration industry trends, vacations and meeting trends, and capital markets. The categories that we've defined for hospitality include hotel, motel, and the subcategories of hotel which include economy or limited service, full service, extended stay hotels, resort or convention centers, bed and breakfast or country inns, casinos, luxury spas, timeshare complex or shared ownership, golf courses, marinas, campgrounds or recreational cabins, Amusement parks, including water parks and indoor water parks, special purpose uses such as a ski lodge or private beach, and finally, mixed use properties. Some key terms you'll need to know when servicing the hospitality property industry include occupancy rate. That means the percentage of available rooms that were leased during a specified time period. The number of hotel rooms leased or sold each night divided by the total number of rooms in the hotel or resort. This number is used to measure the average occupancy of the property. The formula again is occupancy rate equals number of rooms leased divided by the number of rooms available. Average daily rate or ADR, a measure of the average daily rate paid for rooms leased during a specified time period. ADR is calculated by dividing the gross revenue from the rental of rooms by the number of occupied rooms during a specified period of time. ADR equals gross room revenue divided by number of rooms leased. Revenue per available room, or rev par. This term is the industry standard for measuring the revenue generation of any hotel property. It's calculated by multiplying the average daily room rate by the occupancy rate in order to give a single answer for the combination of revenue or price and occupancy or volume. The term also differs from ADR because rev par accounts for the amount of unoccupied available rooms. Rev par equals occupancy rate times average daily rate. So let's look a little closer at hotels and resorts. According to the American Hotel and Lodging Association, AHLA, there are more than 52,500 establishments that provide overnight accommodations in the United States, totaling more than 4.9 million rooms. This diverse industry includes everything from country inns and roadside motels to luxury resorts, casino hotels, and extended stay hotels and perhaps a few hotels that you rent by the hour. The industry covers a wide range of establishments varying greatly by size and by the amenities and services offered to their patrons. Hotels and resorts are categorized in more than a dozen ways including by services and amenities offered, 
by physical and functional characteristics, and by location, by price, and even by brand affiliation. A change in the flag of the hotel and the amenities may actually change the segment of the market that the hotel attracts, which could significantly alter the potential income stream of the property. In order to work in this area of commercial real estate, whether doing sales of existing facilities or developing new facilities, you'll need to understand the industry and the value of each type of establishment. The hotel types as we define them are economy or limited service hotel. They're often referred to as motels. These generally provide limited amenities. A guest simply pays for a room for the night or for a period of time. A full service hotel provides more than overnight accommodations. Full service hotels typically offer additional amenities and additional services which may generate additional revenue streams for the hotel owner. Amenities may include a swimming pool or fitness or exercise rooms and services may include restaurants, a lounge, newsstand or banquet facilities that may be used to provide the owner with additional revenue. A resort or convention center is a self-contained place to stay and to be entertained, offering recreational facilities and generally some business facilities as well. A typical resort includes restaurants, pools, a salon, some shopping and other forms of entertainment. Resorts can include golf courses, ski facilities, health spas, entertainment or shows, and even planned social activities for their guests. Typical resorts also offer convention or conference facilities in order to bring in more guests and to combine business with pleasure. Extended stay hotels target corporate business travelers and moving families. Extended stay hotels are designed to attract guests who stay longer periods of time from 5 to 90 days. Rooms in these types of establishments often include kitchens, entertainment systems, desks or office space with access to the internet. Amenities may also include pools and fitness centers. And finally, a bed and breakfast or country inn. These are typically large single family homes that have been converted into rooms for rent. In a typical B&B, guests are given a bedroom in the home and provided with a breakfast in the morning. Bathrooms may be private or they may be shared with other bedrooms. Bed and breakfasts are often historic homes or homes in scenic or resort locations. And some of them even offer theme rooms. Grading hotels. Like office buildings, hotels and resorts are ranked by quality and amenities. A challenge in grading a hotel, however, depends on what source you use for grading. For example, some in the hotel industry rank hospitality properties as Tier 1 through Tier 4, with Tier 1 being the premier properties in popular resort areas or major metropolitan areas. Other rankings fall into the 1 star through 5 star, or diamond ratings, or AAA ratings, or even one to five rosettes, depending on the source. A common grading system used by J.D. Power & Associates and many independent organizations breaks down hotels into seven categories which may overlap. Luxury, such as the Ritz-Carlton and Four Seasons. Upper upscale, such as Marriott, Sheridan, or Hyatt. Upscale, which includes Courtyard, Hyatt Place, and Residence Inn. Midscale with food and beverage, like a Holiday Inn, a Ramada, or a Wyndham Garden mid-scale without food, such as a Hampton Inn and La Quinta, economy, which includes the Econo Lodge, Super 8, and Motel 6, and independence, like the Elysian and the Mark. Another type of property that comprises hospitality property is a timeshare or vacation ownership program. My opinion is that timeshares tend to fall under a residential real estate use or even under multifamily housing. However, Commercial developers will look at a property to obtain its highest and best use. In order to net the highest return for an investor, the best use of a particular property in a destination location may be to convert the property to a timeshare rather than a hotel or even a multifamily property. When advising a client to purchase an apartment complex or mixed-use property, as a real estate professional, you should carefully consider the possibility of conversion of the property into another use such as condominiums or timeshares. Timeshares are a fractional interest in a piece of property. This fractional interest generally takes the form of a certain amount of time an owner is purchasing for the use of the real estate. There are four primary forms of shared ownership business models. The first one are timeshares or vacation ownership. Sometimes considered to be a prepaid vacation, timeshares or vacation ownership are typically the purchase of the use of an apartment or a villa style accommodation in a managed resort environment. 
Timeshares are typically broken down into weeks. The rights to use an apartment or villa can be fixed to a certain time period each year or every other year, or it can be floating, in which case the owner is able to use the apartment or villa each year for the period of time purchased. But the period can be shifted from year to year, as long as some availability exists. Some floating units are limited to certain seasons or a specific range of weeks. These rights to use the property can be purchased for a specified period of time, like 20 to 50 years, or they can be unlimited deeded use of the property. After development and sale of the project, it can be managed by a developer of the resort or by a management company. Typically, a buyer pays an upfront fee to purchase the timeshare and then pays an ongoing annual maintenance fee, which often includes part of the property taxes, expenses, and management of that property. Packages include Disney Vacation Club, Marriott Vacation Club, and many others. Fractional Ownership and Private Residence Clubs. Like a timeshare or vacation ownership, a fractional property or private residence club allows a purchaser to buy a specific period of time or usage of a real estate investment. The difference is that a private residence club tends to be a longer period of ownership, from one month to three months, and tend to be very high quality property, often with more services than a typical timeshare. Fractional ownership properties can be luxury apartments, condominiums, or even detached single homes. Many of them are found in resort hotel environments. Examples of these types of ownership include the Ritz-Carlton Club and the Marriott Grand Residence Club. Destination Clubs. The third type of vacation ownership is similar to both the timeshare concept and to the private residence club. But a destination club allows a buyer to purchase membership in the club that owns several or many destinations rather than buying the use rights of a specific property or complex in a particular location. For example, the club may purchase a group of properties in the Las Vegas, Orlando, New York, Paris, and a few beach and mountain properties. A buyer into the club would have access to use any of these properties in proportion to their ownership interest in the club. Like a timeshare, the buyers will have ongoing maintenance fees. And condo hotels, or buy to use and let offerings. A relatively new concept of the condo hotel is a hybrid of condominiums and timeshares, or even rental units. A buyer or investor can purchase a specific unit in fee simple title. Although a buyer can use the unit as a principal residence, in most cases the buyer will make use of the property for their own personal use for only a small period of time each year, possibly two to six weeks. The remainder of the time, the unit is managed by the hospitality operator in a rental program. The income derived from the rental of the unit is generally split between the operator and the owner. And mixed use. In many destination locations around the world, developments have been successfully implemented where a mix of different hospitality business models are integrated within the same resort environment, including traditional hotel rooms and suites with timeshares and fractional ownerships. And by the way, the management of timeshares can be either a commercial venture or a residential management venture. Often timeshares are tied in with other hospitality real estate such as an amusement park, ski lodge, or casino. The next type of commercial investment real estate is the multifamily property. And multifamily housing can be simply defined as any building with more than one residential unit. Any apartment building or apartment complex falls into the category of multifamily housing. Realtors and mortgage companies separate multifamily housing into two primary groups. Anything that's between one and four units is considered to be residential in the eyes of a mortgage lender. Any building or complex that has five or more units is considered to be a commercial property. And the rules for lending are different. Investors seek to purchase or develop multifamily housing complexes in order to create an income stream that provides them with a high return on their investment. Commercial real estate investors often begin investing in real estate by purchasing multifamily houses. These buyers can often grow to purchase larger and larger properties. As a real estate agent or consultant, your job may be to assist a property seller with determining the best asking price or to assist a potential buyer or investor with analyzing and buying a property or developing a property for multifamily use. Sources of information about multifamily housing include the National Apartment Association, the Institute of Real Estate Management, and the National Multi-Housing Council. Multifamily housing can be categorized in several different ways. 
Many experts categorize properties by condition, age, and quality of construction, classifying each property AA through D. Other industry experts categorize the various types of multifamily housing by both density and height, although various organizations from appraisers to architects to property management companies to construction firms have developed very different uses for the same classification terms, such as mid-rise and high-rise. The categories that I use include a mix of classifications specific to the height of the property, the age of the property, or the ownership form, such as cooperatives and condominiums. First, a conversion, or single-family conversion, is a residential dwelling or even a commercial property that's been converted into a multifamily dwelling. A duplex or triplex, although the actual definition of a duplex is an apartment that spans two floors, the term is generally used by real estate professionals to refer to a building that was built specifically as a two unit. A triplex refers to a building built as a three unit. Garden apartments generally refer to a low rise, one to three story building or group of buildings that have a communal lawn area or gardens. Garden apartments are generally suburban apartments. Mid-rise, the term is defined differently by appraisers, architects, lenders, property management groups, and other organizations. Some appraisers define mid-rise as four to six stories, some five to eight stories, and others between 50 and 150 feet in height. One dictionary even defines a mid-rise building as moderately tall. Some organizations go so far as to claim that a building must contain a certain density of apartments in order to be considered a mid-rise. Our rule of thumb is four to nine stories. High-rise. As with mid-rise definitions, high-rise definitions are equally as difficult to pin down. Some claim a high-rise is anything over six stories, some claim it's over eight, 10, or 12 stories, and still others claim it's any multifamily building exceeding 120 or 150 feet. Our definition will now and forever be the correct answer, which is 10 stories or greater. A mobile home park is also a form of multifamily occupancy. Generally a suburban property with mobile homes, the park may share one source of water or sewage and in many cases the tenant provides their own mobile home and simply rents the lot from the park owner. Condominiums, a multifamily housing project that's been developed to allow individual owners to take title to a specific unit in the building or complex. The owner purchases the interior of the unit and shares the common areas such as lobby, yard, or amenities with other owners in the building or in the complex. An owner must pay a monthly fee or annual fee for their share of the maintenance and management of the property. Cooperatives, a complex or building that's owned by an association or group of people. All of the owners own a share of the total building or complex and are assigned a unit for their use. Unlike a condominium, the owner does not specifically own the interior of their unit. Mixed use, any combination of residential and commercial use. Although some of these forms of multifamily housing, such as condos and co-ops, don't sound like a commercial investment, keep in mind that they begin as a commercial project and are sold off to individual owners or groups. So how do we compare multifamily property? We typically compare them in two ways. The first way of evaluating them is to compare the property with other similar properties in the same geographic area. Different investors prefer different comparison techniques. Some make property comparisons based on a simple price per unit formula, which I wholeheartedly disagree with. Others compare properties based on their incomes. One method of comparison on income is the gross rent multiplier, or GRM, also known as the gross income multiplier, or GIM. And others use the property's cap rate, based on the net operating income of the property. Each of these methods is a straight comparison with competing or recently sold properties in the same area. The second form of evaluation is used to compare a property or a group of properties with other investments. Cash on cash return, internal rate of return, or net present value calculations, which will be discussed in detail in our financial analysis video, evaluate the true economic gain of the property by factoring the long-term income stream and ultimate appreciation of the property into the evaluation of the current value of the asset. So let's run through the basic comparison approaches. Comparing properties by price per unit. That's simply the sales price divided by the number of units. This calculation should only, only, only be used when comparing buildings of similar age and similar units in the same area. 
It is meaningless, for example, to compare the average price per unit of multifamily dwellings in Houston when you're trying to determine a price range for a property in Denver, or comparing a brand new garden complex in the suburbs to a 50-year-old complex in an urban location. Many investors like this calculation because it's relatively simple. However, the number does little to give us an indication of what type of return a particular property is generating. Each investor has their own way of determining if an investment is right for them. But investors should be most concerned about the return on their investment based on the risk they're taking. Comparing properties by gross rent multiplier or gross income multiplier. As with price per unit, I'm not a big fan of using gross rent multipliers. This is again a simplistic way of comparing properties. The GRM is equal to the sales price divided by the gross scheduled income of the property. Some investors use a yearly gross income and some use a monthly gross income. In either case, you must be consistent when comparing properties. The benefit of a GRM is that you don't have to research the expenses of the property. The risk of using a GRM for calculation is that one property's expenses may be significantly different than another. In one property, the owner may pay for the heat, or in another, a municipal authority may have much higher rates for water and sewer usage. Once again, I find it extremely important to truly know the bottom line. What is the return an investor will receive on his investment? Cap rate is short for capitalization rate. The cap rate is a simple attempt to compare various properties based on their return. In simplest terms, the net operating income is derived by taking the total of all rents per year, the gross income, and deducting any vacancy and collection losses for the year, and any expenses the owner pays except the mortgage, except the principal and interest. In other words, take the gross income after vacancy and deduct the property taxes, the property insurance, annual maintenance, and any utility bills the owner pays each year. After determining the NOI, or net operating income, divide that number by the sales price and that will give you a quick return on investment. Although this is a popular method used by investors and it's an easy calculation to compare properties, there are many shortcomings of this calculation as well. The rate of return derived from this calculation is not a true depiction of the income because it's a snapshot of one year's estimated net operating income. From an investment perspective, it does not take into account the type of loan the investor is able to obtain or the investor's tax structure and so on. From a comparison perspective, because it's a snapshot in time of one year, appreciation for the area is not considered in the calculation. An investment property in Allentown, Pennsylvania, for example, may have a cap rate of 9%, where a similar investment property in New York City may have a cap rate of 4.5%. A straight comparison of cap rates may lead an investor to believe that the return in Allentown is better. However, the New York property may have such a high rate of appreciation for income or property value that the overall return for the New York property could be greater. That's why cap rate comparisons are generally only effective to compare various homes in the same geographic area. The final one we'll do here today is cash on cash return. The simple formula is that cash on cash return equals the net cash profit divided by the cash invested. The cash on cash return rate is also known as the equity dividend rate, the equity cap rate, and the cash throw off rate. Cash on cash return is a far more complete determination of the return on a property. It takes into consideration the actual cash invested by the buyer, including the down payment and the closing costs, and the mortgage payment in order to give a true picture of what kind of return an investor will actually receive on a particular property. The way we arrive at the numbers, we first determine the cash that's invested. Cash invested equals the down payment plus the closing cost of purchase. Then we determine the cash we get back out after paying expenses in the mortgage. So we take the gross income minus any vacancies, which gives us our effective gross income, and the expenses are only those expenses paid by the property owner. We calculate a net operating income by subtracting those expenses from the effective gross income, net operating income equals effective gross income minus expenses, and we get our net profit by subtracting the mortgage payments or debt service. So net profit equals net operating income minus yearly mortgage payments. The cash on cash return then equals the net profit divided by the cash invested. Senior housing and long-term care facilities. While some realtors consider senior housing and long-term care facilities 
to be a form of multifamily housing. It is an entire industry unto itself. A great variety of long-term housing exists for elderly and those who need constant care. Commercial housing facilities are purchased by both investors looking for a return, as well as healthcare professionals looking for a business to manage and maintain. Regulations vary from state to state, and the industry is heavily regulated by many agencies. If you're representing a buyer or seller in a long-term care industry, you should contact your state agencies and determine all the requirements necessary to transfer the property from one entity to another. In many states, the process requires inspections, certifications, and often several months before the state will allow the sale and the transfer to be completed. Like multifamily housing and shopping centers, long-term care facilities are generally priced by their return on investment. Different levels of care require different commitments from both the owner of the facility and the management of the facility. The major forms of long-term care facilities include independent living, although this particular category may fall under multifamily housing as well. It refers to housing specifically designed for seniors in which the resident does not need daily assistance with medicine or personal care. As with multifamily housing, these may be low-rise, mid-rise, or high-rise. Assisted living. Housing designed for individuals who need some ongoing assistance, but who do not need the medical care provided in a nursing home. Assisted living facilities are generally designed to allow a resident much of the freedom of independent living, but with the benefit of a safe environment, with the assistance that they need. Most assisted living facilities provide meals for the residents, as well as other services, including salons, activities, and entertainment. A Continuing Care Retirement Community, CCRC, or Life Care Community, is a retirement community that provides medical and health care options for its residents, including an on-site skilled nursing unit. One of the primary benefits of a CCRC to the resident is the ability for a couple to stay together should one of them need medical attention and supervision. Dementia care facilities are specifically tailored for patients with dementia or Alzheimer's, diseases that can result in the loss of skills for everyday living. A patient can be disoriented, have a reduction in their judgment or memory or function, or possess an altered emotional state. Special care units for dementia or Alzheimer's provide 24-hour care or can provide period care, such as adult daycare for patients. And of course, nursing care or nursing homes. These are facilities that provide for residents with chronic illness or disability. Although nursing homes are generally focused on the elderly, residents often include those who have difficulty with mobility or eating disorders. As our population ages, there's a lot of money to be made in senior care facilities and to work with them. You need to be familiar with the terms for those investors or business owners who purchase them. And these include facility operating margins, income as a proportion of revenue available to service the debt. Unlike many other investments we've looked at, this is the gross income before interest taxes and amortization and depreciation, but less the debt. Because reserves are a fundamental component of analyzing this type of facility, you'll also be asked for the EBITDAR, or the earnings before taxes, but after deducting reserves. And the occupancy rate, although a more apt term might be occupancy level. Unlike most multifamily housing, which tends to lease apartments for long periods of time, many long-term care facilities have a constant flow of residents in and out of the facility. Residents may need more care than a facility can provide, or they may pass away, or their health may improve. The occupancy rate is calculated by determining the average number of residents per day during a particular period, generally a year, and multiplying that average by the number of days in that period. More information can be obtained from the National Investment Center for Seniors Housing and Care Industry, NIC, at or through the American Association of Homes and Services for the Aging, AAHSA. The next form of commercial property is the commercial farm or ranch. Now, if you're thinking about a small family farm down the road where someone is living, raising a single horse and perhaps some crops for their family, you may consider a farm to be a residential property. However, farms are commercial properties and can bring in a solid return to an investor. Some commercial farms are used to grow produce, such as wheat or corn. 
Some farms are commercial horse facilities, such as those breeding and training thoroughbreds, or those deriving an income from boarding horses and training riders. Large commercial farms are often sold to investors, such as pension funds, and leased back to farmers at a price per acre to produce crops. In fact, some large pension funds are getting better returns on buying farmland and leasing it to farmers than they are from buying large office complexes. And there's a lot less that can go wrong with a piece of land than with a large building. These types of agribusinesses do not easily fit into any other form of commercial real estate. Many of these properties require commercial loans, and many of them are used as a primary business for the owners. Additionally, large real estate investors and large commercial investors look to develop new commercial and residential real estate projects. If you're assisting in site location and site development for a builder, developer, or investment group, you need to be familiar with farms. Like most forms of commercial property, there are a number of types of farm uses. Some of the major ones include commercial agricultural farms or agribusiness, commonly known as crop farms. These are farms that grow any type of crop for public sale. These farms may be run by the owners, or they may be owned by an investment pool or fund that leases the land back to the farmers at a price per acre, producing an investment return for the investors. Some associations break out subsets of commercial crop farms to include separate categories for plantation farming, for grain farming, or for fruit or orchard farming, but all produce a form of a crop. Commercial boarding facilities or equine businesses derive income from boarding tenant horses and collecting a monthly fee for housing the horses, turning them out, feeding and caring for them. A secondary business often used in boarding facilities is a rider training program or riding camps. Others make money training horses or training the riders. Livestock farms. Although livestock and breeding farms are often horse farms as well, they could be cattle farms, pig farms, alpaca farms, or any other type of animal. Some organizations also break down subsets of cattle ranches and poultry farms, but both breed and sell livestock. Dairy farms, a slight variation from either crop farms or a breeding farm, this type of business raises animals to produce a product from those animals, in this case milk. Similar farms sell wool from sheep or alpacas, eggs from chickens, or other products. And timberland, the timber industry, like any farming industry, locates or grows a crop and harvests that crop. Timberland is simply a specific type of crop. Vacant developable land. Vacant land can refer to any size vacant property from a single in-town lot to a several hundred acre parcel. As commercial real estate brokers and agents, our interest in vacant parcels of land is generally for one or two types of prospects. The first type is an investment speculator who's looking to buy land and hold on to it for some period of time. A speculator is generally someone who has an expectation that the value of the property will increase more rapidly than inflation and provide a return on the investment at some future date. This is a highly risky investment and must be carefully considered by the investor. The second and more prevalent type of investor looking for raw or vacant land is one who wants to develop the property into some form of a commercial use. The investor may be looking to build a multifamily housing project or an office building in order to rent the property and create a return. Other possibilities are that the investor may be looking to build a condominium project and sell it off to create a quick return. Or the investor may be looking to build a specific kind of business such as a hotel or a golf course. Whatever use the buyer or investor desires to develop, as a realtor, you must research the zoning of each property to find property that lends itself to that use. If the buyer is looking to develop a warehouse in a particular area, then you must determine which zoning codes allow warehouses and locate properties for sale in those zones or find owners who are willing to sell property in those zones. Remember that you are never limited to those properties that are actively available. The last form we'll explore in today's program is business opportunity. Selling a business is often more complicated than selling a commercial property or office building. Purchasing any type of real estate is generally not a completely passive method of investing. However, purchasing an office building to rent to tenants is generally far more passive than purchasing a business that an investor may have to personally operate. While it's true that some businesses are sold complete with management and very little need for direct supervision by the investor, most require the investor to step in and make the business their career. 
Some business opportunities include the real estate they occupy, and others simply include the equipment, the name of the business, employees, and the goodwill of their past performance. Businesses are priced on their net profits. Although many business owners would like the price to be based on their cost of equipment and inventory, as a real estate professional, you must understand that the buyer will not pay a price that will give the buyer no return or negative return on their investment. Business brokers use a quick ratio or an acid test ratio to determine the health of a small business. The quick ratio is equal to the amount of the current assets less the inventory divided by the current liabilities. The standard is one to one because a business should at minimum have enough current income to balance current expenses. Business opportunities are generally categorized by one of four business categories. Retail business, which is generally a business that sells a product like a Dunkin' Donuts, a Jiffy Lube, a laundry or a Subway, or provides simple services such as a Curves. A professional business, such as a dental office, an insurance office, or even a real estate office. Because of the licensure requirements, these are generally purchased by buyers in those professions. A distribution business or wholesale business. A distributor is the middleman between the manufacturer and the retailer. A distributor may buy truckloads of vegetables from farms and resell them to grocery stores or purchase beverages directly from the maker and distribute them to restaurants. And finally, a manufacturing business. The creation or production of anything to be sold. Each type of business has a standard industry classification code or an SIC. When marketing a business, commercial realtors will often first contact owners of similar SIC categories to determine if the business is a good fit for others to absorb into their current portfolio. A dental practice, for example, is likely to be sold either to another dental practice or to a dentist going out on his or her own. Business brokerage is a bit different than all the other property types we've discussed before this, and evaluating and selling a business can be complex. It's important to ask questions of any business owner considering selling. Remember that before a buyer leaps into the purchase of a business, they should have a clear picture of how the business operates. For example, in the salon industry, customers tend to stay with a particular stylist. If the owner has a great income on her books, but has recently lost three top stylists to other salons, the business could be in trouble. Analyze the customer base and whether the market for the business is growing, declining, or remaining stable. So let's ask them some questions. Who are you selling to? directly to consumers or to distributors and wholesalers? What is the approximate number of customers that you have? Do any of those customers account for more than 10% of your annual business? Do you only sell locally or are you regional or national? What is the trend of your market? Is it increasing, stable, or declining? How do you promote or market your products or services? Why are you considering selling your business or company? We analyze businesses by creating a SWOT chart of the business. SWOT is an acronym for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats of any business. Again, when a buyer is making a decision to change their life by taking over and running someone else's company or business, they want a very clear picture of what to expect. They should have a clear definition of the business strengths. This includes the location of the business, the employees or sales force, the product line, and the efficiency of the operation. Buyers also need to understand what challenges exist in the same areas as the business strengths. What are the potential weaknesses of the business? And what are the opportunities? In what way would the current owner change or improve the company? And why isn't it being done currently? Are there any markets that can be expanded into? And can a new market be captured? And finally, threats. Is a competitor considering opening nearby? Is a key employee retiring? Is there a decline in the demand for your product or service? In summary, many specialties exist within the universe of commercial real estate sales, leasing, and management. You may choose to specialize in one particular type of property and become a specialist. In fact, you may specialize simply in leasing office space or in leasing retail space, or you may choose to attempt to handle all types of commercial real estate transactions. But I think it's very important that a commercial agent recognize and understand the various types of commercial real estate and the nuances of each category and some of the key terminology of each category. We've covered a lot of ground today and I hope you're getting a feel for just how large the commercial real estate universe truly is. So let me leave you with a few of my favorite quotes. 
Babe Ruth said, every strike brings me closer to the next home run. As you've probably learned today, it's going to take you some time to learn the commercial real estate field. If you stick with it, you will hit the greatest home runs of your career. And I'm certain you've heard Robert Frost's line, two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that made all the difference. Far too many residential realtors never make that leap into commercial brokerage because they're afraid they can't compete. There are so many numbers and an entirely different language to this business. But commercial real estate is the road less traveled. You can continue to be one of the many, many people in real estate selling residential homes. Or you can become one of the few who excels in the commercial side of our industry. And finally, something I've lived by, although I've made mistakes throughout my life, it's not the things I've done that I've regretted. It's the things that I didn't do when I had the chance. Of the thousands of people I've had the opportunity and the privilege of speaking to, training, and mentoring, the response that affects me the most is when one of them says to me, I just wish I had made this leap sooner. Now it's your turn to take that leap. Until next time, I'm Lauren Kime with Real Estate's Next Level Education, and you've been watching an introduction to Commercial Real Estate Fundamentals, the first session in our commercial training system, and I hope to see you in the next program.